Zachariah. He was a nice person. He was a decent person. He was very smart. He was the only Christian in the whole of the school. And I hated him. And because I thought as a Muslim, I must be better than him. But he was better than I. We start to beat him every single day that we come to school. And we agreed on that night, we need to kill him. It was dark, it was uh, cold, and we went ahead of him. And we were five of us. We climbed a tree and we waited there. And from far away, we saw that a torch coming. And the light became bigger and bigger as it approached us. And the minute that he just went under the tree, we jumped at him. He was crying, he was screaming, he was shouting. We broke his arm, we broke his leg. He started to bleed. And because he started to scream and begging for help, I put my hand in his mouth so that no noise will come out of him. It's similar when you are slaughtering a sheep, you know, it's just shivering and the others were, were beating him. I felt very proud. You were actually doing something for, for Allah. You know, you want to please him. And suddenly, he could no longer breathe and we could not hear his voice. We left him in the wood between life and death. We went back, you wash yourself and you pray. And Zechariah never came back. I've never seen him again. I was born and raised up in a very, very fanatic Muslim family. When I was a child, my father brought me to a Quran school. I was only eight years old, and my father just dropped me there. They shaved my head. We sat in a circle. The Shaykh sat in the middle of the circle and he has a very long whip. I was forced to memorize the Quran. Every mistake that you do, this whip will just come right in the middle of your head. You're not allowed to cry because in our culture they tell you men never cry. I was crying every single night. And they told me you belong to the Islamic Ummah. And that's why you fight for it, you stay loyal to it. I started to hate people, to hate everybody who's not a Muslim. And I especially used to hate the Jews. So I was preparing myself to go and fight for Allah in the jihad. But every night I went to bed, and when we put the light off, I did not know what will happen with me if I die. My cousin was severely sick and the doctors, they said he's going to die. They gave him only a couple of days. And when they came two people, they were Coptic Christians. And one of them wanted to greet me. And then I saw he had a cross. And then I pulled my hand back. I said, well, I'm not going to touch a hand with a cross. And then he said to me, we hear that this child is sick. We would like to pray for him. And only out of politeness, I told them, okay. And they started to speak to God like a person that he speaks to his friend. They said, God, please heal this child. The minute that they said, Amen, this child opened his eyes for the first time in four weeks. He started to move his hands. He started to speak. He sat down in his bed and he started to walk. And one of those two persons who prayed sat down with me and he said to me, you know what? The real miracle is that God wants to change your heart. Do you believe that Yeshua is alive? And I told him, yeah. Because according to the Islamic tradition, God took him to heaven and he's alive and he will come back one day. And he said to me, because he's alive, you can speak to him. That changed my entire life. And when I started to read the scripture, nobody needed to convince me to love the Jewish people. The only way 
for Muslims to start to love the Jews is when they meet Yeshua. I loved my family, I loved my father. I loved my mother and I loved my community. And when I decided to follow Yeshua, my grandfather and my father said to me, you are no longer one of us. They made a funeral. They invited friends and family. They brought a coffin to the cemetery and they said, our son is dead. To be declared dead with no family. I said to God, where are you? I hear this voice and this voice told me, you know that the grave where your name is written, you know that grave is empty. And guess what? My grave is also empty. I went to Egypt for the first time after many years and I was in a pastoral conference. And one of the Sudanese pastors came to me, it's an elderly man, gray hair, started to speak to me and he asked me, where did you come from? I told him my story. He started to cry. And then I asked him, why are you crying? And he said to me, do you remember me? My name is Zachariah. And suddenly, I remembered him. The last time I saw him, it was in that dark night. I could hear suddenly the way that he was screaming, even though that was 25 years. Suddenly I started to see his broken arm and broken legs. I started to see the scars, which I caused him. I started to be full of shame. I was a bad person, yeah. I was terrible. So Zachariah looked me straight into the eye again and he said to me, yes, sir, because you hated me so much. I was always praying for you. He opened his Bible and the minute he opened his Bible, I saw that my name was written in the first page. I hated him, he prayed for me. On that day, God confronted me. He said to me, even before you start to think about me, I was thinking about you. To love those who hate you, you need someone whose name is Yeshua. Of course, when I went to Mecca, I was going there in order to pay homage to the Kaaba and to fulfill the requirements in Islam. But that night, I saw Jesus in a dream. First, Jesus touched my forehead with his finger. And after touching me, he said, you belong to me. And then he touched me above my heart. You have been saved. Follow me. You belong to me, he said. So I decided, okay, I am not going to finish the Hajj, the pilgrimage. Whatever it takes, I am going to follow that voice. In the church, if you ask how many people, how people came to Christ, 80% will say they saw him in a dream. So I decided to, to ask him, and so I did. And then um, the next day, I guess, I saw a dream, and I saw in my dream, I saw Jesus was a bridge, I decided to come to him. <laughs> 